Hi, I'm Annie Leonard with the story of stuff. I am really excited to be talking to all of you today to launch our new podcast series, The Good Stuff. People often ask me how I stay so hopeful in spite of the bad news about the environment and economy today. It's because of all of you. One of the great things about my job is hearing from people all over the world that are working for a better future. We wanted to share some of these stories of solutions, so we put a call out to our community and we got flooded with ideas. We'll be looking at some of these solutions in this podcast over the next year. So let's go. Plastic bags are everywhere. They litter our landscape, floating along roadsides and collected in tree branches. They collect in the ocean where sea turtles and other animals mistake them for jellyfish and eat them. They clog drains, increasing flooding in places like Bangladesh, and in India, sacred cows are dying from eating them mixed in with the organic rubbish. They clog up recycling machines, thwarting other plastic recycling. And let's not forget, they're made from oil, with all that oil extraction and processing brings. In a word, they're gross, and it's time our societies move beyond them, a relic of a mistaken era. We all get frustrated by the number of plastic bags we see and even use every day. The average shopper in the U.S. now uses about 500 a year. Some people, like those we'll talk to today, didn't just get frustrated. They got active. They decided to be part of the solution, taking a stand for a better future. A few years ago, after Andy Keller lost his job, he was doing some yard work and had to haul some trash to the local dump, one of my favorite places to visit, too. He was shocked at what he saw there, a sea of plastic bags. He thought there must be a better way. He got a used sewing machine, and pretty soon he came up with an attractive, lightweight, reusable bag that scrunches into a tiny pocket. His Chico bags, named after his hometown, have become so successful that they've displaced mountains of plastic bags. So successful that three of the biggest plastic bag companies in the country took Andy to court to try to shut him up. Hi, Annie. How are you? I'm good. Thank you so much for taking time to talk to us today. Okay, yeah, it's my pleasure. It was a trip to the landfill that, that started you on this, so I wanted to hear about your trip to the landfill. Yeah. I didn't know what I wanted to do, and I ended up tearing apart my yard and doing some yard work, and uh, I had some stuff, basically, and I, I brought the stuff where you, you bring stuff, and that's the landfill, and I ended up at my local landfill. I live in a town of about 100,000 people, and and it just it just struck me as like, the, the, the feeling of disgust that I had, like, I could taste it almost like the smell of the landfill. And then as my view broadened, what monopolized my view were all the plastic bags. And they were everywhere. Like they were blowing around and um, and they were caught in the tractors and they were caught on the fences and they caught on the tie downs and the birds were pecking at them. And it just, I got, it just hit me. I'm like, oh, I use those plastic bags. And I never thought about what they were made out of. I didn't think about how long I used them. I didn't think about where they went or how long they lasted when they went there. I didn't think about any of that, but it all kind of hit me, you know, not not as coherently as that, but it, you know, I had a gut feeling in my heart. I just knew. I'm like, okay, I got to kick my bag habit. I got I to gotta stop using plastic bags. If I could solve this problem, I could probably make a business out of it. And so I, I bought a sewing machine that day, bought some fabric, and sat down at my kitchen table and I started making prototypes to what would be the first Chico bag. That is such a cool story. The last landfill I went to um, had a big chain link fence around it, and so many plastic bags were blowing in the wind and getting caught in the fence that they had three full-time employees whose job was solely to pull the plastic bags out of the fence around this landfill. I mean, it is just incredible, the scale of these things. (laughs) (laughs) And and that's something that's not reported. People don't talk about that, you know, and and that's one of the big issues. And the the plastic bag industry for years has been saying, you know, bags don't litter, people do. And it's not a product problem, it's a people problem. But that that flies in the face of this evidence that shows that plastic bags have an inherent ability to become windblown litter. At the Story of Stuff project, we get thousands of emails and letters from people who see something wrong in society, you know, whether it's overpackaging in a fast food restaurant or lousy food in their kid's school or, you know, just an infinite number of problems of ways that we could do things better. So we get thousands of letters and emails from people who say, I'm upset about this. I want to make a better world, but I'm only one person. I don't know how to start. So tell me about your alter ego, the bag monster. Sure. Bag monster is something that 
happen organically. I used to carry around a bag, basically a ball of 500 bags, and that's what I estimate the average American uses in plastic bags every year. How big of a ball is that, 500 bags? Uh, well, that ball turned into the bag monster, which essentially is this creature that is covered from head to toe in plastic bags. So you can you know, imagine the Stay Puft Marshmallow Man or you know, imagine the Michelin Man, but in bags. I use that because people don't realize how many bags they actually use. You know, they never let them accumulate for a year to see that. You know, it, it goes to that place called away or it goes in the recycle bin. And um, when people first come face to face with the bag monster, I either get one of two express one, one of two replies. One is, "Oh, I never I never realized I used that many bags." And then, and then the other reply I get is, "Oh, oh, honey, I use way more bags than that." <laughs> you know, and, and and that's the reality is it is an average number. And but most people realize very quickly that I actually don't need to use that many bags. You know, as a result. I ended up getting myself sued. <laughs> right. The plastic bag industry sued you because your website used some numbers from the EPA that they said weren't accurate. They later settled out of court, but it must have cost you a lot of time and money to defend yourself. So I'm not surprised that you've been a target, and in many ways that is a badge of honor because it means that your message is resonating and you're making traction. So tell us about that. Uh, the same three companies that have sued my company sued the city of Oakland. Um, one of the companies is involved in this organization called Save the Plastic Bag Coalition, which uh, essentially is a group that sues municipalities here in California. It sounds like a joke, the Save the Plastic Bag Coalition. When I actually first read that, I thought it was a joke. It's actually true that they have an organization named that? Yeah, they do have an organization named that, and I would agree uh, that it is a joke. <laughs> There's not a lot of credibility within the plastic bag industry. And, and that's one of the reasons why there's so many bag bans going forward and that they're not really getting any traction and stopping it. But I also always like to remind people that putting your plastic or whatever it is, putting something in a blue recycling bin is not the same thing as recycling. That's putting something in a recycling bin. What matters then is what happens to this stuff. So what I actually did was tracked a bunch of the plastic that was being put in recycling bins. So I got my hand on some customs data that found huge amounts of plastic waste being shipped from the United States to Asia, supposedly supposedly for recycling. And I actually went there. I went to Hong Kong and China and Indonesia and India and Philippines and Indonesia tracking this plastic stuff that literally was all classified as recycling and, and was collected in recycling programs. And what I saw over there is not what, you know, green-oriented eco-consumers in the U.S. have in mind when we put our stuff in the recycling bin. I saw a lot of the stuff just getting chucked. I saw lots of it getting just piled up and burned. And I'm sure you know that burning plastic releases all kinds of hazardous stuff. Um, the stuff that was recycled, it was actually reprocessed, not recycled, because it wasn't made into the same thing. But it was disgusting. I mean, these were horrible factories. We would never want them in our own country. So even um, recycling, just because it's called that, does not always mean it's a real solution. It's just yet another reason why we got to focus on reduction, not just recycling. It was a really fascinating um, experience to, to be able to go see these things firsthand. Industry has promoted recycling so heavily that it's become this catch-all for reducing or reusing that um, that's the first thing people think about is recycle. Because it, it, because essentially, you know, as you know, it, it gives permission to people to consume as much as they want guilt-free because it's recyclable. I think it's really important that we spread this message because so often environmentalists and carry your own bag kind of people have this image of being, you know, whiny and wonky and naggy. And we really got to break out that and realize it's not about sacrifice and hardship. It's about having way more fun while we're working to make the world a better place. So I just wanted to hear from you is, is has it been fun? And, and what has been sort of an, an unexpected benefit that has come from doing this work? Yeah, I, I do. I do love my work. I think I'm doing the right thing. And, uh, yeah, that goes really far. You know, so even though this is probably the most stressful point in my life, um, I I know that I'm doing something that is in line with what my dad taught me, is always leave a place better than the way you found it. And so, you know, that's what I'm doing, and it feels really good. God, it's such a no-brainer, win-win-win situation here. Is you have more friends, you have more happiness, and you have less litter. Um, thank you so much for the work that you're doing.
Around the world, more than 80 places have policies to limit plastic bag use. But if you look at the list, in the U.S. at least, most of those are the kind of places where people carry yoga mats and drive hybrid cars. Then there's Brownsville, Texas, on the Mexican border, one of the poorest cities in the United States. With high unemployment, industrial pollution, and other pressing problems, you might think doing something about plastic bags isn't a priority. Not so. Let's talk to Rose Timmer, a community activist who led the campaign to ban plastic bags in Brownsville. Along the way, she found some unlikely allies. Brownsville, Texas is at the very tip of Texas. Our uh, main street actually crosses a bridge and crosses the Rio Grande, and it becomes the main street for Matamoros, Mexico. So tell me about how did you get a mandatory ban on plastic bags? This is the kind of thing that I go to sleep dreaming of. How did you achieve that? We are uh, healthy communities of Brownsville. We're a nonprofit. I'm the only paid employee, but we do have quite a large volunteer base. One of our volunteer bases um, uh, focuses only on environmental issues, littering, trash, uh, recycling, reducing, reusing. And we have uh, a lady who was approached that, that heads that group and, and calls the meetings and all that. And she was approached by our city mayor, can you see about getting this on the uh, agenda for the city commission because I can't seem to do it. So after that, we... Um, decided to do a short survey. It was 10 questions in English and Spanish. Volunteers went out to different parts of our community. We did it at a city commission meeting. We did it with the Rotary Club. We did it with the farmer's market people when they were there on a Saturday morning. Uh, Parent involvement with our school district. We only have one school district, so we went to them, and they had a big fair, about 700 parents. We interviewed as many of them as we could, surveyed as many of them as we could. So everywhere we went, we were doing a survey for about 90 days. And finally, we got through that survey, and one of my volunteers is an engineer put it all together for us. And we went before the city commission. That was October of 2009. And we gave them the information that the city was ready to get rid of plastic bags. So I understand that one of the first things you did was call the managers of Brownsville's Walmarts and grocery stores to a meeting. We had them at breakfast, told them what we were planning to do, what our survey results were. And they came back and basically said, hmm, we don't like it, but we will support you because it is a city ordinance and we are, corp- we are city corporate citizens and we will follow what you ask us to do. The next thing we did was a BYOB, bring your own bag. Um, Earth Day of 2010, these big stores gave out close to 50,000 reusable bags. People came in. They were told that if they brought in their plastic bags and traded them 10 plastic bags for one reusable bag, people were doing that. We did it at the mall. We only have one mall. We did it there. People would go to the store, buy something, bring it bring their plastic bag to our table and exchange it for a reusable bag. And these bags were all donated by these big stores. And I'm not saying that we did not have any negative feedback. We did, but I can name that on on one hand, the people that were against the bag ban. And so you did a voluntary ban first and then a mandatory ban? Yes. We did a voluntary ban for a year. Hmm. And at that time... We did the advertising, we did the media campaign, we did the digital billboards, we let people know it was coming. Every month up until October of 2010, we had uh, one day where we would not, we asked the retailers not to give out plastic bags, to only give reusable bags. And come January the 5th of 2011, it became mandatory, and to everyone's surprise, it's it happened. It's 10 months since the ban. Are you seeing a change in litter and a change in what people are putting in their garbage cans? Our litter problem, I have to tell you, we um, put, kept in close ties with the waste management people. And uh, they came back and told us they no longer see these plastic black bags flying out of their trucks. Uh, they're not gumming up any uh, uh equipment that they might have when they process their stuff. So it's been a real help to them. And you will notice it when you come into our area 
that we don't have the bags up along the fences and along the trees and that kind of stuff. It's amazing. And I heard that now the success has inspired some other local towns with South Padre Island. Um, Corpus Christi, Coastal City, they're getting ready to introduce one. Houston, Galveston, Laredo, El Paso. So I'd imagine that Brownsville is facing a lot of the same kind of problems that so many communities in the United States are facing, from community safety and access to health care to unbelievable unemployment and foreclosures. Mm -hmm. In the light of all of these really severe economic and environmental and social threats, how did you get people to care about plastic bags? One thing we did do with the school was had contests about our trash problem and plastic bags. We had a focus on litter photo contest. And the kids were asked to take pictures of trash places and what was going on and submit them, and we had judges judge them. We had a contest that uh, the kids painted trash cans so people could learn to put trash in the trash can. We had a private school that did a uh, recyclable fashion uh, fashionista contest, and they took things made out of plastic and uh, and any recyclables and make fashions out of them. Um, we have a young lady who put a bottle tree together, a whole lot of plastic bottles. <laughs> it's just awareness, and I think that's where we are. We just kept the chatter going. We kept talking about it. It sounds like you also made it fun by having contests and art and enrolling the kids, and that seems like a real key to success is that while we're making the world better, if we can have fun, it's a lot easier to recruit people. It's a lot easier, right. What are you taking on next? <sighs> oh, we want to say cigarette butts or plastic bottles. Oh, I'm right there with you on both of those. Well, wow. well, I will stay tuned to watch um, how that campaign unfolds, and I hope that you have the, as equal success as you had on this. And thank you so much for your work for the environment and for being an inspiration to people all over the world that are also concerned about plastic bags. Plastic bags may seem like a small problem in light of all that we're facing today, but fighting them and finding solutions is important. It's important for our health and for the planet's health. It's also important for building our citizen muscles. We learn to make change by making change. Today, taking on plastic bags. Tomorrow, creating a sustainable and just society. Sometimes the solution lies in local community action, as in Brownsville. Other times it's designing a new product that eliminates waste at its source, and that helps build a sustainable economy. There are so many solutions out there. It's like a solutions buffet. Pick the one that works for you. If you're not sure, try a few. I guarantee there is a way for everyone to get involved. And in doing so, we'll build the power to create a better future. We'll build community, we'll make friends, and we'll have more fun. That's it for this episode of The Good Stuff. Our show comes to you from the studios of Youth Radio in Oakland, California. Our engineer is James Rowlands. Post-production by Brandon McFarland. The Good Stuff is produced by Bill Walker. We'll have another show online in a few weeks. If you like this podcast, please share it with your friends. Find us on Facebook and storyofstuff.org and keep working on the good stuff in your own community. Thanks for being part of the solution.